Working Trinity, we are going to raise a hallelujah this morning. So wherever you are, whatever you're doing, stop and raise a hallelujah. Hallelujah. In the presence of my enemies.
gather here and air conditioning and lights and comfort, we remember our brothers and sisters around the world struggling, struggling with storms, with fires, with earthquakes, with famine, the list goes on. So today, let us rejoice and say it is better to be here and to give God our thanks. Let us pray. Oh, gracious God, thank you. Thank you for all the ways that you are working in our lives. Thank you for all the ways that, that you take care of us. You are there walking with us through the storms. Those times that just knocked us flat. Those times in life where we just can't seem to catch our breath and know which way to go. But you are there. 
carrying us, giving us your strength, and for that we are grateful. We remember today people who are, are struggling. We remember our brothers and sisters in Haiti, oh, so many who mourn, so many who are struggling to, to put a roof over their family's head. Survive. We remember our brothers and sisters in Afghanistan who are scared, worried. We remember our brothers and sisters in our country and fires that are all over the world, actually. And so many are struggling with day to day difficulties. Lord, you know each person's difficulty here right now. You know their need. We pray that that your Holy Spirit will touch them. Will touch those people who are in our hearts and minds. Because you are the great healer. You bring healing to our bodies. We pray for all those struggling with illness. We pray for those struggling with what's just being tired. Doctors and nurses and caregivers. We pray for those that are struggling. Scared. That's what the next step in life is. And for all those that may be living in the fog of depression, anxiety, be a beacon of light for them, Lord. Show them hope. And we pray that each one of us will hear your, your, your nudging to reach out to someone around us to be that beacon of hope for them. Well, Lord, we pray for this church. We pray that we truly can embrace your vision, your call in our lives. So we look to see how you carry us forward into the future. We thank you for leaders who listen to you and are willing to give their time and their talents. So, Lord, as we gather here today, we pray your Holy Spirit will just rain down upon us, rain on this worship service, that we will be refreshed, renewed, and focused on you. And it is with that focus on you that we join our voices together everywhere. Pray the prayer that you taught us, Jesus. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trust us against us. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. Thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. You just kind of say this real quick. Um, this next song, when my husband died, I don't know how I was going to make it. I really did. But the people in this church, and the Christian music, just spoke to my heart. And this song is called Tim Brady. And anybody can break those tunnels that are holding you down. Holding you back and moving on to have a happy, contented life. It's our Lord Jesus Christ. And I'm going to sing this song, and I hope those of you who know it will sing the chorus with me because to me, these are the most powerful words. If you've been walking the same old road for miles and miles, 
We've been hearing the same old voice tell the same old lies. We've been trying to fill the same old holes inside. There's a bed There's a bed some of the tribes in, in uh, Africa, Zulu tribes. I had a friend, a clergy friend, who worked in South Africa, and he told me about this word, and it fascinated me. Umbutu. And it means, basically, not, hi, how are you? That's what we do. But it means, I see you. I see you. And I now just see you, I see your family. And the reply that we're to give is, Ubuntu. And the reply means, I see and value you too. I love that whole concept that 
whole concept of, of who we are and what it means to live our life together. Another part of that phrase that it can also be interpreted, I am because we are. I am because we are. Reminding us of the big picture of who we are in life together. Well, as Christians, I think this is a great word because it really reflects what Jesus came to tell us. It's how Jesus saw us. Saw us as people of worth. Not as people that were damaged or not valuable, but that all people are for worth. And it's so much so that Jesus died for each one of us. Not because we were wonderful and valuable, but because had worth in his eyes. We all, he died for each one of us who are sinners. Every one of us. And it means, when we think of it this way, that all people are claimed by grace, the grace that Jesus offers us. That as a child of God, as part of the family of God, we all are part of the family. Whether we accept that gift or even recognize it or not, it truly makes us part of something bigger than just us. Now, when you meet somebody, you go, oh, yeah, there's a child of God. Is that what you say? I sort of doubt it. If you told me you did, I'd, I'd go, hmm, okay. We, when we meet people, we see them, especially for the first time, and we, we make an impression about them, don't we? We sort of judge who they are or what we think they are. We may judge them by their handshake, by their appearance, by their speech, by lots of different things. We make an image of who that person is. That's our first impression. And as much as we hate to admit it, we all do it. Every one of us, we do it. Can you think of somebody who you had a first impression of, that after you got to know them, you realized it wasn't right? It was very different than what you had written. They were very different than who you had originally thought. Well, I do a lot of premarital counseling. And I always ask, you know, how did you meet and what attracted you to that person when you first met them? And I'm really surprised at how many people will say, I didn't really like them. Or, she didn't, wasn't attractive to me. But I'm really surprised how many people don't have that, that instant first, you know, fall in love. But that as they got to know each other, they grew until they couldn't imagine not being there with each other. Well, the early Christians, when we think about their communities, they were very small. In the early days, it was a small community, and people knew each other. But they were also spread out. And they just had the advantage of FaceTime or, you know, talking to each other on phone or seeing each other's picture. And so one of the things that happened is when a new leader came into town, let's say somebody had been sent to a community to teach them, to preach with them, to, to build a community, they would either send a recommendation letter ahead of time saying this person's coming, like was done with Timothy um, in, or Barnabas, or they would, that person would carry that recommendation letter with them to validate who they were. So they promised hey, Because there were a lot of people who said they were followers of Jesus that really weren't. There were a lot of scam artists, even back 
2,000 years ago who would take advantage of people that were seeking somebody and seeking to change and grow in some way. Well, in our scripture today, what you're going to find is um, a reference to this recommendation letter. Our scripture is in first, our Second Corinthians, the third chapter, verses one through six. And in this, we find that um, Paul has received word that he needs to go back to the town of Corinth, and they're asking him to send a recommendation letter. Now Paul's like, what? This is a real slap in the face to him because. He started that church. He was there for a long time. He started the church, brought most of those people to Christ, taught them everything they knew. And yet, because there had been a little bit of disagreement at some point with some people, and some of these false witnesses had come into the community and were trying to stir up trouble and saying, Paul doesn't really know what he's talking about. Don't, you know. I don't think he's really a follower of Jesus. And do you really believe Jesus rose from the dead? You know, they were creating all these doubts. And so they said, I think you need to get a recommendation letter on this call before he can come back here. Trying to keep him away, in other words. It really showed people's distrust in some of their faith of the early days. Well, when they asked for him to bring to send a letter, a recommendation letter, this was his response. See if you can figure out what he's talking about. Are we beginning to commend ourselves again? Or do we need, like some people, letters of recommendation to you or from you? You yourselves are our letter, written on our hearts, known and read by everyone. You show that you are a letter from Christ, the result of our ministry together, written not with ink, but with the Spirit of the living God, not on tablets of stone, but on tablets of human hearts. Such confidence we have through Christ before God, not that we are competent in ourselves to claim anything for ourselves, but our competence comes from God. He has made us competent as ministers of a new covenant, not of the letter, but of the Spirit. For the letter kills, but the Spirit gives life. The letter kills, but the Spirit gives life. Why didn't he need a letter? Who did he say his letter was? The people in Corinth. He said, you are my letter. The evidence of the Holy Spirit at work is seen in you. I don't need to provide an outside letter because you are my letter. same true for us? Are we recommendation letters for Christ? Do our lives show the working of the Holy Spirit bringing change? Is Christ evident in our lives, in our homes, in all that we do, in our work? Is it evident? Well, people today can go online and find out what they need to find out about us, where we work, what we do, basically some of what we like if they watch our Facebook long enough. But they can't find out about our character. And that's why sometimes we still need to send recommendation letters to people or give them to tell about your character. Now, as you know, I've been moving and sorting through things, and I found two recommendation letters that I had kept, which I was a little surprised I kept them. One was a recommendation letter from uh, 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 
friend who wrote when I was adopting my son. I needed to send a recommendation letter to the agency. And the other was a recommendation from uh, another friend for when I was applying to seminary. And I kept both of those. I guess you just want to read something nice about yourself once in a while, maybe. I don't know. But I, I found them when I was packing. And it made me think about those reference letters. The life that we live that tells who we are in Christ. How many of you need reference letters? Have you needed them for jobs? Have you needed them for HOAs to say you can come into their organization? Um, you know, lots of different things that we need recommendation letters for. Well, what would happen if you gave them your baptism certificate? Or your Bible that was worn and showed your markings and where you read things that thoughts that were important to you. Do you think that would would suffice? Paul here is saying that we are the living recommendation. We are the living recommendation letters that people need to see in the world. That, that we introduce Jesus to others, that we demonstrate how Jesus has power to bring change in our lives. He talks about letters that are written in stone versus letters written on the heart. He's referring to the letters of stone more the legalistic letters of Ten Commandments and things that, that he, as a zealot, wants to use and promote it to try to persecute Christians until that day of his transformation when the Holy Spirit wrote on his heart. And the key to that is the relationships that we have. Being a zealot, sticking to the rules and, and following, making sure everybody did it just right, didn't give him life. That's when he talks about he died. That was a living death. But when he found a relationship with Jesus, he found life. He knew for the first time what, what living truly was. And the evidence of that is what people witness in us, that relationship with Christ. Now, as you know, I have been doing cookies and community. What is the one I'm Conversation. I don't even know where I'm, where I've been anymore. Cookies and conversation groups. We've been doing lots of groups around since I've talked to over 100 people in the church. Um, through these small groups. And I've been hearing a lot of things, and, and I hope that you will come next Wednesday. I'm going to put a plug, okay? Next Sunday afternoon, we're going to gather here in the sanctuary and talk about what I heard and talk a little bit about some of what this means for the church and, and where we go from here. So I hope whether you came to a group or not, doesn't matter that you will come and, and be a part of it next uh, Sunday afternoon. Well, I'm going to give you, here's, here's my uh, teaser, all right? One of the things that I did ask people, I asked how they came to Trinity, how they got started here at Trinity. I kept them here. And I haven't compiled, so I can't give you numbers at this point, but what I heard well, I will, I'm doing a just off the cuff guess. Probably 85% of the people said it was somebody invited them or a relationship that, where they already knew somebody here. It was the relationship of Christ in our hearts, working in our hearts. And it shows that it's relationships that make a difference. And so Christ to other people. Something in that in those people's lives was a recommendation to Jesus. 
Well, another thing that we looked at was this, when we looked at recommendations, is not only are we recommendations individually, but also as a community. Trinity is a recommendation letter. Have you ever thought about that? We are a letter to others, a letter saying, Jesus changes things. And I like go back to that phrase that's in Luke 2. We are, I am because we are. Being part of a bigger picture makes a difference. Now, the old social worker in me found this in the African Journal of Social Work. It said, Ubuntu is a view that an authentic, that an authentic human being is part of a larger and more significant relational, communal, societal, environmental, and spiritual world. That covers everything, doesn't it? If we're part of something bigger than ourselves. And that's what Paul is saying, too. He's saying we're part of not just this, but part of the new covenant, the new community that Jesus gave to us. It was a new movement, a new movement taking it forward. And as a result of that, we need to value each one of us. So it's here for you at home, wherever we are, we value each part of this community of Trinity. And we know that through our relationship with Christ, we're part of something bigger. We go back to that Jesus invites us, accepts us, loves us, forgives us, and values each person, warts and all. Do you ever sometimes go, why in the world did Jesus, why does he like me? Why, why did Jesus forgive me? That is that grace that just comes and surrounds us. Now there is a lot of, a lot of concern that the church is dying, that people aren't going to Christ or to having those relationships. But this reminds us that it's not about the building. It's about the heart that gets changed. And when you look at society a little bit, the way that we reach out, our letter that we send, the letter that we re- uh, reflect, shows how people see meaning. And you can see it in society. Gen Xers, the generation below baby boomers, they have shown through the years that they are more adaptable than previous generations. The millennials, or Generation Y, and that's the next one, and they're probably 24 to uh, 39 age-wise. They, there doesn't seem differences between people near as much as the previous generations. And Gen Xers, or are, are 2 to 24, and Gen Xers, um, I'm sorry, Gen Z's, I said it wrong, Gen Z's, people born after 2000, they see a passion for human rights in this generation that hasn't been seen before in other generations. A passion for Everybody has a place. Inclusive. They don't see differences, they see similarities. Jesus' eyes see in all of us. So if we are recommendation letters, we have to think about the letters that we're sending out. Who are we sending our letters out to? How are we writing our letters in a way that people will hear it, hear the relationship with Christ? 
And sometimes we have to look at the different generations and figure out, are we writing a letter to our generation by what we do, or are we writing a recommendation to get to know Christ in a way that other generations will hear? And one thing that is common that I see across the board, people say people don't want to be, they, they're not, they don't want to be part of faith anymore. And that is not true. I see the generations longing and seeking, seeking to know something of God. Some of them know it's Christ, they just don't want to see Christ in the same format that maybe we're comfortable with. But there is a longing to have that relationship that are all, is already there. And so that's part of us. If we are to be recommendation letters for Christ, maybe we have to rewrite our letters a little bit. But the key is that the authentic relationship with Jesus Christ shows trust that we have, that we are accepted and loved and of worth, and that everybody else is too, through Christ, is genuine and real. Genuine and real. Desmond Tutu, in his book, No Future Without Forgiveness, he said this. He said, in my theology, there are no ordinary people. Each one of us, because we are God's representative, God's viceroy, God's stand-in, and God's carrier, each one of us is a special person or a VIP far more important and far more universal than your normal VIP. You didn't know how special you were, did you? For Christians, that Zulu word, Ubuntu, should have a special meaning for us because it reminds us of the power of the relationship with Jesus, who died for all of us and who sees us not as the flawed people we see or that we see others, but sees us as the children of God, loved, forgiven. In Ubuntu, I see you, and you are a child of Christ. That's right. The gracious God, thank you. Thank you for accepting us, for loving us when we do not feel worthy. But be in there for us when we need you so much. And we know that there are many other people seeking to find value in life and that you are the answer for them. Help us to be your recommendation letter, both as individuals and as a church community that speaks to the lives of others through our relationship with you.
that is knocking on your heart to be reminded that without Jesus is a struggle for nothing. And more importantly, that we need to represent and show and be that lover for all people. So this week, feel God walking with you and shout out with everything you do how much you are loved and accepted. Thank the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit. Everybody home and here say, Amen. There is one day in your house, 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 there is one day in